All right, everybody, welcome back to episode three of the Surfside Recovery Podcast. Today, we are going to discuss medicated assisted treatment. Uh, real quick before we start, make sure you, uh, you know, follow us on Instagram at Surfside NJ. Uh, our website is structuredsoberliving.com. We also have a Twitter account, which is Surfside SSL. And uh, Facebook. Facebook, of course. Everyone has a Facebook, and so do we. It's Surfside Structured Sober Living. Uh, so today, me and Ian decided we wanted to talk a little bit about Medicaid-assisted treatment. Uh, I'm actually pretty interested to hear what your take on, is on it. Mine has changed drastically over the past, I'd say probably the past year. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Medicaid-assisted treatment is the use of uh, Suboxone, Methadone, um, Vivitrol. Vivitrol, and Abuse. Is there any other ones that I'm... I mean, those are the bigger. Those are, those are the big ones. So now... With medicaid assisted treatment, the programs are supposed to accompany some sort of therapy or what like I don't know anything other than buying suboxone or going to a suboxone doctor that's about the experience i have like personal experience I have with it so I think the reason we wanted to talk about this or the reason I wanted to talk about this was mm-hmm. I got a message um from one of our alumni's parents mm hmm uh, maybe a couple weeks ago here, and it says, uh, hi, Ian, hope you're well. Continue to pray for Surfside. We're grateful that you're there, blah, 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 blah. Um, I have a question. Have you changed your mind on the use of long-term Suboxone? Just wondering and struggling with it. Blank is not on Suboxone um, and has not wanted to be on, which I'm grateful for, but the push for MAT here in the state that they're in uh, and across the board is overwhelming. I respect your opinion and wonder where you stand. Mm -hmm. And so I think the issue, can you let my assistant in? Oh, we're going to let Charlie in? Yeah. Charles? Come on, bud. Charlie is the uh, French bulldog. He's the the official mascot of Surfside. All right. All right. So I think I think the issue is that um, with medicated assisted treatment is that there's a lot of unknowns. Right. So typically when we talk about MAT, we're talking about initially it was methadone. Mm-hmm. What a lot of people don't know is, uh, and I guess to give some context to this, so I've worked in addiction. Well, I worked in mental health and addiction for 15 years. Right. Um, I do have a master's degree. I'm licensed. I've been licensed for, what's it, 2019? I've been licensed since uh, 2010, so nine years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I worked at a methadone clinic for three years in New Hampshire. I did work at an intensive outpatient that had Suboxone. Mm-hmm. That was, I would say that was like right after I got licensed, so probably eight nine years ago and we're saying we're saying licensed uh, uh, licensed as a uh, clinical drug and alcohol counselor that's a lcadc yeah. right is that it, what that yeah, is yeah they're they're different and different hold on <laughs> they're different in different he, la- states. he landed on his feet yeah. just in case you were wondering he's fine um they're different in different states but in new jersey yeah, it's an lcadc right, okay. so licensed clinical alcohol with. and drug counselor okay um so methadone was originally known as dolphine. Mm-hmm. Dolphine was created by Hitler. Okay. Um, so what he found was that, so during World War II, he was giving a lot of his soldiers morphine. Right. Amphetamines and too. Yeah. Primarily the morphine. Um, he's so noisy. Um, primarily the morphine. And, uh, What was happening was the soldiers were able to fight longer. Mm -hmm. Their feet weren't getting as cold in their boots. I mean, really, they were just numb to it. (laughs) Right. They were they were like becoming super super soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. And and they were really like fighting um, his fight. But they were starting to run out of morphine. Mm -hmm. So he had some of his doctors create dolphine, which is is methadone. Mm -hmm. However, the first. Uh, problem that they started to see with the dolphin was that it created this incredible lethargy. So 
the soldiers were kind of getting into the like, well, we'll do it tomorrow syndrome. Right. Um, instead of like being ready to go, they were more like ready to sit down. Um, <laughs> uh, and that's, that's where it started. So fast forward, you know, you've got, um, the crack e- epidemic in the eighties, but there was also heroin. Right. Um, I think there was a big push after Vietnam when folks were coming home, um, but not as many were coming home as addicted to heroin as they thought. Um, That's a whole other topic in itself. Uh, But but folks started to get the the methadone, and methadone was designed to be a long-term substitute for heroin. Right. It was not considered to be abstinence-based recovery. It was considered to be harm reduction. Right. Harm reduction is reducing overall harm with stakeholders involved. So it, it that it, like uh like needle exchange programs also fall in the category sure. of harm, harm reduction. reduction. Yeah. And and there's nothing wrong with harm reduction, but it's it's different it's a different form of recovery. Recovery is a very loose word right. where you know my definition of recovery may be very different than somebody like you or whoever else, right? right? right somebody right, right, right. like a, a militant old AA guy, his definition of recovery could be very different or an NA guy or whatever. Uh-huh. Um, but harm reduction is basically reducing harm. So if I'm, so if you're doing whatever, five bags of heroin a day and you have to rob and steal and cheat and I give you X amount of methadone a day and instead of um, having to do all those things, you just show up at the clinic, get your methadone, and are able to like go home. Right. We've reduced the harm. Right. Your quality of life may not have improved oh, much. Sneeze. <coughs> but we've re- we've reduced the harm. Right. Yeah. And you, and, and you could even make the argument that now, like, uh, you know, crime reduction, uh, you know, as a result of that too. So sure. it's like harm on the person, Absolutely. and then harm also on, on, on all the stake, community. All stakeholders. Right. right? So right. stakeholders would be anybody in the community, really. Right. Okay. Um, including the person. So fast forward to, I don't know, 10 ish years ago, uh, Suboxone came onto the market Mm -hmm. and Suboxone was supposed to be the new great, the cure all, right? Not even cure all, but the great detox med. Right. Okay. It was going to allow people to detox from heroin Mm -hmm. fairly, uh, smooth. And it was going to be this great thing. However, it quickly became one of the most widely abused drugs. Mm-hmm. And it was abused uh, more so from from like selling it versus getting high on it. Right, 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 right. Which what happens is if I have a script of Suboxone, I sell you a couple of Suboxone, you get to use heroin a couple of days a week, stop using heroin, let it come out of your system, uh, or I mean, uh, you can use Suboxone a couple days a week, stop using Suboxone, let it come out of your system, use heroin for a bunch of days. When you run out of money, mm-hmm. you can start taking your Suboxone again. Right. And you don't get dope sick. Um, recently, uh, Vivitrol came out. So so Suboxone was a pill. Now it's a strip. I think you s- can still get it as a pill. Mm-hmm. Um, there's Suboxone, Suboxone. Um, the difference is Suboxone. I always get them confused. One has the blocker, one doesn't. There's Suboxone and there's Subutex. Correct. Subutex doesn't have the blocker, and there's Correct. also a new uh, one that's been out for a couple of years uh, called Subsolve. Is that the injectable? No, it's not the injectable, but what it does... What is your dog doing? He's trying to bury himself in the blankets. Um, what Subsolve is, is the actual like number uh, of milligrams is lower and I can't remember it off the top of my head, but say, you know, you have an eight milligrams of box and strip or pill. Uh, Subsolve will be something like 5.7, but the bioavailability is supposed to be higher. It's essentially giving you the same thing. Um, I took those for a short period of time solely because the flavor was much better than regular Suboxone, and I couldn't handle that, like, nasty orange mm-hmm. taste. Uh, so, I, so I was on Subsolve for maybe, I don't know, probably a month or something like that. But I did the same thing. I would, I would get them, then I'd take them for a day or two, sell them, use the money to buy heroin, and then keep a couple for me. And then, you know, it was just like yeah. this, this game of, you know, I'd sell a couple, use that money for dope, 
do the dope, go back on, sell more, and it was just like this like flip flop back and, and you forth. And you can actually function longer, right, as an active drug addict because you yeah, are you, able to you, like you're, you're stretching it out. out. Yeah, yeah, you're stretching it out, and, yeah. and that's what it that's what it did for me. Uh, I remember one time I went in uh, to a suboxone doctor, and uh, you know I came in and I was positive for like heroin and weed, and then he was like, "All right, you need to come back in a week." And we'll see how your drug test is, and that'll be dependent. Yeah. And then I came back the next time, and I had like weed, coke, and PCP, and a couple other things in my system. <laughs> and the guy's like, "He's like, dude, like, what do you, you like? This is worse than what you came in last week." Yeah. And uh, I was like, I shrugged my shoulder. I was like, I don't know what to tell him. You yeah. know, I said, "Sorry, can I still get the script?" Um. So 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 then right. So to fast forward, now we have the Vivitrol push. Uh -huh. which is injectable suboxone is also injectable now um and that and vivitrol is just a blocker vivitrol is a blocker you can't uh, get intoxicated on it it seems like you actually cannot they've said for years that you could not get high on suboxone but the the results are in and that's not actually the case getting high on suboxone yeah you can totally you definitely yeah, can yeah, i used to shoot uh yeah, subutex absolutely definitely get high um <laughs> and our one friend his drug of choice was suboxone and he used to literally oh yes, run yes, out yes, yes, and yes. he used to go to treatment just to get scripts of suboxone yep. yeah so but there's still doctors out there saying that you can't um I, I don't understand that but um so then the vivitrol push was this great blocker lasts for 30 days, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. It does not last for 30 days, roughly 15 to 20. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually feel it in your arm as it starts to melt away. You can use again. Right. Uh, so, and that, you know, just to clarify, that is just an opiate and I believe alcohol blocker, right? Or is that not true? They prescribe it for alcohol, but it's like, right, like they prescribe gabapentin, which is a neurological painkiller for anxiety. I mean. Okay. So it has. I I don't particularly know. Right. Um, okay. But it it's not for anything like uh, it's not for cocaine. It's not yeah. for speed. It's not for anything like yeah. that. It's, it, it's for opiates. Yeah. Mainly and potentially alcohol. And, and I should also say, as as a professional, like I don't, and I probably should do more of this than than I do. But I don't particularly pay attention to what it does to the brain, what parts of the brain. Right. I don't particularly care. It either works or it doesn't. You either can get high on it or you can't. I particularly look for things that work that you can't get high on. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Um, and we're not exactly coming at it from a, a purely scientific no, approach. And, so, moving forward, now we have this massive push. Uh, so I was at a, an event recently. Governor Christie was there, ex-Governor Christie, who was like, he really was like uh, um really pushing for recovery i think which was mm -hmm. good um but I he's mean, like he had to i mean people were overdosing left and right in his state yeah in, in his town i mean right uh where he's from is is horrible and it's incredibly wealthy area right. incredibly wealthy and it's horrible um but we've got uh this money that's for recovery and like he puts out a bunch of sound bites but i think everybody again is is really mis misinformed where like currently in the state of new jersey you can't deny anybody uh from any sort of recovery housing um if they're on medicated assisted treatment and that's new right that is as of uh, i believe june of this past year right yeah. okay um and you know, we actually have gotten some flack from the community, which is bizarre. Uh, people have literally sent me text messages saying, why are you allowing people on Suboxone? Right. My response is like, it's not necessarily my opinion. And and the reality of it is that the guys who've come to Surfside on Suboxone have done phenomenal. Right. Like phenomenal. And see, that's what changed my mind about it over the past year or so. I was seeing guys come into the house on Suboxone. They go through with the work and then gradually come off and they're doing well. Phenomenal. And and again, so so if so so you initially said that this stuff is supposed to be coupled with therapy, but it's not. Okay. 
Methadone, the regs around med- methadone are incredibly strict. You mm-hmm. have to show up literally every day to get like your four dose. 4 o'clock in the morning, right? 5 o'clock in the morning, something like uh, that? The local one opens at 6. <laughs> yeah, the one uh, in Camden, I think, opened at like 4.35. Yeah. So the local one is like dosing is between like 6 and noon. You've got to show up. You, you have a time slot. You're supposed to be there based on your schedule. Right. If you're there X amount of days without giving dirty urines, if you're going to your two counseling sessions a week or whatever, it may mm-hmm. be one group, one counseling session, eventually you start to get take-homes. Right. To get 29 or 30 take-homes, so basically a month's worth, takes about two years of doing everything you're supposed to do. Right. So it's a, it's a process of mm-hmm. showing up every single day. It starts with automatically you get a Sunday, then eventually you get a Saturday and a Sunday. Then eventually you get like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Mm-hmm. You know, and and it just slowly builds. Um, Suboxone, you show up at the doctor, you can get a script for thirty days, and that's it. Right. Well, s- sometimes I guess depending on the doctor, the doctors that I've been to, there's no actual reg. Oh, so there's no regulation. I guess it's dependent on whatever the professional Correct. decides they want to do. Because the, the the one guy I went to, he uh. Uh, I came in, he gave it to me right off the rip because of my, my urine test, and then he made me come back uh, weekly for like a month. And I mean, by the end of the month, I just I stopped showing up because I couldn't get any other drugs out of my system. It just w- wasn't happening. Yeah. Um, so that ended that. But I still had, you know, however many days of a prescription, you know, held, uh, you know, like on me that I filled bef- before that stopped. Um, so what do, what do you... What are your thoughts on how it's being used, like like currently, like uh, in the addiction treatment industry or in like the sober living community? Or... So, so the addiction. So, what's really funny is that some of the facilities that um, tout themselves as being like the best, mm-hmm. um, who for years have been like very heavy, we are a twelve step based facility, are all moving towards medicated assisted treatment. Do you have any idea why, like, why do you think yeah. that you want to say why well, it is? Well, they're moving that way because the insurance industry is starting to move into results-based reimbursement. So basically, if my facility, let's say I run a rehab, and my facility has a 50% relapse rate the day they leave, and your facility has a 50% relapse rate after six months, you're providing better results. So therefore, I'm going to reimburse you more, or the insurance company is going to reimburse you more than they're going to reimburse me. Right. So, those stats are just so janky, man. So, so what? Ha- and and <laughs> I'm know, don't like quote the, don't quote me. Right. On the yeah. Stats. Of course, we're, ma- we're making up numbers. We're yeah, making up I'm numbers. Totally here. making up numbers. It's not about the stats. And it's, and it's no. I just mean like uh, uh, when rehabs and facilities like that use like data collection stats. I'm always like. You take any any sort of statistics with a grain of salt. We can go down that. Right. I would be happy to, to to do a whole thing about. Well, that. we'll do another um, episode yeah, about I'd that. I'd be happy to do a whole thing about that. I'll write that down. So um, I don't forget. Yeah. So, um, right. So basically, it's about this reimbursement. So, like, if I can prove to the insurer that uh, you're going to be sober longer, I'm going to potentially get a higher rate. Now, that being said. There is a huge piece of the reality of this is like with opiates. I mean, there are so many people dying. Mm -hmm. The current statistics basically look like uh, we have a nine eleven every three weeks. Yeah, that's that's wild when you put it in terms like that. Nine eleven every three weeks. Yeah, I saw something that uh, you know in the past year or something like that, more people uh, died of you know overdoses than uh, the entire Vietnam War. And people were like protesting, marching on Washington during during that time. Yeah, and we have we have so right when we talk about the quote unquote opiate epidemic, we've got like all these people hiding in the closets and like nobody wants to talk about it. And and some of the like wealthiest counties mm-hmm. uh, in the, in the country are being affected the most because their kids have unlimited resources. Right, and you know so. Right, like, so can Suboxone be done appropriately? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, can anything be done appropriately? Absolutely. But is it being done appropriately is mm-hmm. the question. You know, are we really coupling, um, are we setting people up for success? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that for me is, like, always what it's about. Are we really teaching people, you know, how to live and how to, like, function and how to thrive? Uh, you know, like, we have we have a graduate 
who I think he started using uh, smoking pot pretty much the day he left. I think he was with us for like six months, maybe. Right. Started smoking pot the day he left. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's unclear how regular it is. Um, one of his buddies overdosed and died mm-hmm. uh, since he's been out. And this kid's holding two jobs down. Right. Uh, living on his own. Prior to Surfside, he never even had a job. Mm-hmm. Um, was 100% financially dependent on his family prior to Surfside. Now, could he use Suboxone? Absolutely. Is he? No. Um, mm-hmm. Is he managing by just smoking pot? Yeah. Do I think that's a horrible idea? Absolutely. <laughs> Do I think it's like a matter of time before it blows up in his face? Yeah, most likely. One, 100%. Right, without It's going to happen. Right. Um, and I've heard some stories that there's been some, some struggle for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but y- you can't deny that like he has been, he has been set up for success. Right. Um, the idea of Suboxone really, I think in my eyes is to prevent an overdose. Method- right. Methadone. The problem with is that the, the quality of life really, really sucks. Yeah. Um, not for everybody, mm-hmm. but you know, and I think also we have a lot of people, a lot of advocates and a lot of people in the addiction industry that like talk about this stuff like they know. Like I've worked in a methadone clinic for three years, like out of 65 clients on my pay, on my mm-hmm. uh, 65 clients on my my roster, my caseload. Right. Um, three came off methadone. And how long did you work there? Three years. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's the thing I've seen with a lot of people on methadone. It sucks to come off. Sucks was, the life out of them. Yeah, I was in I was in rehab with a guy uh, who's on methadone for like 20 years, and I think he was only about like uh, probably 50, 55 years old, and he looked like he was 80. Couldn't walk, couldn't see at all. Um, and that's the one thing that scares me about people being on Suboxone too. Like the withdrawal from Suboxone is terrible. Like it 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 really sucks coming off of mm-hmm. it, and they don't really have from my, you know, little understanding, I've never really seen like a like a great Suboxone taper. Uh, Any time that I was on Suboxone for an extended period of time, of course, not like medically like put on it. Like I'm talking about buying Suboxone or Subutex off the street to come off of it. Like if I was on it for, say, let's a week, a month, a, a, you know, a, a never stayed on it for a year, but probably a month or two mm. on it straight in order to come off like I did heroin again because I was getting sick from the Suboxone. So that was my detox was was switch back to heroin. So, so this is yeah, so this is what we're talking about. So so the reality of it is is people don't want to be on meds. Right. That is like is that is like as, as normal of a human statement as possible. I can't you really think so? The- 100%. People human beings do not want to take medications in the big picture. Think about your parents. Think about grandparents. Oh, I've got to take all these meds. Yeah. It's yeah, like yeah. people don't want to have to take medication. Now, kids early in recovery want to be on a bunch of different pills. Because they still want to get high. <laughs> I mean, that's, really, that's the reality. They, yeah. just, they still want to get high. Uh-huh. They're lazy. They have no motivation. They're looking for the easy way out. Right. You know, Caffeine they're, pills. They're, yeah, they've been getting Red Bulls, like flipping sort of participation trophies. Like, so they just want it easy. Right. That's not the reality. In general, people don't want to take medication. So people get on Suboxone with the intent of being on it long term. They're on it for a period of time. Right. They decide they actually don't want to be on it. So they start to taper down. They taper down. They get sick because they're doing it on their own because everyone else is telling them they have to stay on it. Right. They get sick. They get high. They start to cycle all over again. Mm-hmm. If a person is supported appropriately and the taper is done appropriately, they can successfully come off without a problem. I mean, right. we've, we've had it. Yeah. Right? But, like, mind you, we have it with guys who are, like, literally going to 12-step meetings daily. Their right. sponsors know about it, and their sponsors are supporting them in that process. We know about mm-hmm. it. We're supporting them in the process. The doctor, psychiatrist, family knows about it. They're supporting them in the process. Right. It is exponentially different than Johnny sucking on 8 milligrams of Suboxone at home and then thinking, you know what, this sucks. I'm going to smoke a little weed to help my anxiety. Smokes a little weed. The doctor's like, oh, wait a second. You're beat because now you're pissing dirty. Mm-hmm. And now they're getting high and they're back in treatment and the cycle has started. So, you know, if we're preventing, de- for if 
ultimately with MAT, if we're preventing death, that's number one. Yeah, right. Because if somebody is alive, there is still a window. There's a better, well, there's a chance there as is, opposed to there not a, being a chance yeah, at all. There is a window for them to potentially want help. Right. Um, I mean, look, our, our statistics show that um, our guys have been to, on average, at 27 years old, our guys have been to, on average, four and a half treatment centers prior to coming yeah, to I think I was at 12 or 13 or something like that. Oh, I think we have you down for six. We should six? <laughs> we should really? change that yeah, number. No, yeah. yeah, I think it's more. Um, but, but. I mean, that's a that's a it's lot more than six. it's a lot of tries that's horrible <laughs> that's a lot of tries right that's a lot of tries for someone to get yeah sober and like and be institutionalized right like be in an actual center. yeah for sure yeah it's a lot um and it's like i can't tell you how many parents talk to me about this stuff and they're like oh well i thought he got treatment well treatment isn't treatment mm -hmm. right like not for nothing based on the definition of treatment suboxone is more of treatment right. than sitting in group talking about your freaking day. Right. You know, and yeah, I know for me that, 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 that like inpatient rehabilitation and the detox w was important because I couldn't like, I couldn't stop using unless I was away. And I, to me, like when I talk to people about going to treatment, like a, a, a friend of mine that is now, um, you know, with us, when I talked to him about going, I said, it, it's like, he was thinking that it was going to be like this, like cure all thing when you go. And I'm like, dude, it, it, it's really just like, so you're not buying drugs anymore. Like, that was the only thing the treatment really did for me. Like that, the inpatient part, it, it was separation essentially. So, and look, it, there's nothing wrong with that, but I, that's just the way it is. I do a whole training on, um, I do a training for, for, uh, social workers and for LPCs and LCADCs. And it's basically called. When 28 days is not enough and the whole point is, right. is really studying uh looking at memory it's it's one of the main points mm -hmm. and just based on like a normal human memory and i'm not going to get into it we can only remember about 70 percent of what happened in the last 24 hours or no 30 percent of what happened in the last 24 hours so now i'm trying to sit back and remember what i had the yesterday <laughs> I mean, this is real, though. Like, right. you know, somebody if, if somebody actually watches this podcast the 24 hours after it, they're not going to remember 70 percent of it. Right. Um, That's just too much information. Two days later, 48 mm -hmm. hours, they're going to be down to about uh, maybe 25, 20 percent, mm -hmm. 72 hours. It's going to be 10 percent. And that's going to be their takeaway. Right. So if someone walks out of 28 days in treatment. Within. <coughs> three days they remember if they were pretty girls if the food was good mm -hmm. and if their counselor was okay or not right suboxone increases their chance to figure it out on the outside mm -hmm. i'm not saying i want everyone on suboxone because i i don't mm -hmm. think that's necessary but you know if it's looking at like sending someone home or putting them on suboxone and sending them home i would rather them on suboxone um, but I really almost would even say put them on methadone because it's more regulated. Really? It's more regulated. It's all about regulation, right? It's right, all about, right, 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 right. right? It's, it's about supporting and giving structure to someone who is uh, by default unmotivated and, and uh, can't structure their life. Yeah, to me, I think it's important is, is, is you know, there's, there's structure and then there's like good structure. You know, you know what I mean? Uh, it, it depends on how the structure actually looks, whether or not it's going to be effective or not. And I, and look, yeah, we build a whole program around it. Right, so I yeah. get it. Um, and, and again, there's no really right or wrong. Um, you know, some of the stuff with Suboxone that, that has been a trick for people is that 12 step recovery, um, is really obnoxious around you know they're not sober right but it's like is it any other business yeah is there, any, is there any other business than, and does it to me it's like does it really really matter like i felt that way before when i was getting high you know and then seeing people uh succeed uh through like a, a medicaid assisted treatment uh a taper coupled with you know 12 step work and therapy and like yeah and see, seeing all that all that stuff butt. work yeah i'm like but it's I, but again I, all right it's it's a mindset right like we talked about that on the first first podcast like getting your your morning together this whole thing is about mindset mm -hmm. if if your mindset is that you want to get well 
and you're willing to do literally anything anybody tells you to do to get well, you're going to get well. Right. If your mindset is that you just want to take some pill and have a, a quick, easy way out, you're fucked. <laughs> or you're not, you're not going to get sober. Forever. I mean, yeah. you're not going to get, but even, yeah. but even that you're not going to get sober. You're going to take the pill for a period of time and it's not going to be good enough. Right. So you're going to say, fuck this. You're going to sell it and then you're going to go get high. And that's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. That's what happened to me time and time again. Like if you, if you really and truly want to get well and you're willing to do whatever it takes, like it doesn't fucking matter what the idiots in AA say or NA say, you're going to show up at that meeting. You're going to find someone to sponsor you. You're going to move through the program. You're going to work the 12 steps and you're going to get it together. Right. And then hopefully is the idea is you probably want to get off at some point. Maybe, maybe not. Whatever. Yeah. I mean, look, there's a guy local and a lot of people uh, don't even know he's on Subox and he's been sober, whatever, two, three years, something like that. Mm -hmm. He's on like two milligrams uh, a day, right. which is like nothing. Yeah. Um, who cares? Right. Yeah, he's, who he's, cares? He's he's not smoking crack and he's helping me. Helping Dude, people. and and the, well, the crazy thing is like, there's people in twelve step recovery that if they found out he was on it, they'd be like, oh, he's not sober. Right. Yeah. Guys had stable employment. He's rebuilt his family. He helps others for like two or three years, two mm -hmm. milligrams a day. Ibuprofen is almost stronger than that. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I think that I think there's a place for it, and I think. For me, um, it's not even so much about, like, does Suboxone, is Suboxone good or is it bad? It's there's different folks for different strokes, and, and if somebody wants to get well, they should have a shot at getting well. Right. And yeah, if, I would agree with that. And if the prescribed dosage is Suboxone and then couple that with, like, other stuff, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all, it's all about being in the business of whatever sets a person up for the best chance of success. You know, I don't think it should really matter whether – you know, it's medicated assisted treatment or not, or, I mean, I guess really it's going to kind of divulge in time because this whole MAT thing, I wouldn't really say it's new, but uh, the way that it's getting integrated with, you know, different programs and stuff is, is I would say it's pretty new. Uh, I know when I went to yeah. rehab for the first time, they didn't even, like, Suboxone wasn't a thing. Yeah. Like, my first rehab, they gave me Tramadol and uh, uh, Phenobart as detox meds. Mm. I said to the lady, I was like, when do I get a Suboxone? She's like, yeah, we don't do that here. <laughs> what? Dude, the detox. It was I horrible. Worked, I worked at a detox for three years, and if you were if you were doing dope, uh, or or methadone for that matter, uh, your detox taper was going to be one milligram of Xanax every six hours, and we would slap a clonidine patch on you. We'd shuffle you to the back and let you get sick, and that would be that. Huh. Yeah, hopefully you would sleep, but probably not. <laughs> no. No, nah, one milligram of Xanax wouldn't, no. that wouldn't, that wouldn't help me sleep. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, uh, I, I think the whole, whole process is interesting. It's going to like continue and continue and continue to unfold. So what I mean, the, the, the reality of it is, is like the insurance companies are driving addiction treatment. Right. And the insurance no, like companies, medical industry. the insurance companies would much rather pay for you to be on Suboxone than in residential. <laughs> I mean, look, yeah, like it's a, lot, it's, a, it's a lot cheaper. I mean, residential facilities are billing on insurance anywhere from low, low, low Medicaid rates, roughly 300 a day, um, mm. upwards of like high out of network rates are going to be like somewhere around 2,500, yeah. maybe a little bit more mm -hmm. a day. Um, you know, one dose, uh, Medicaid reimburses one dose of methadone for $4 a day. Say that again. Medicaid reimburses methadone rates mm -hmm. at four dollars a day per dose. Per dose. Hmm. So, and then, and then they the mandate is that you've got to do three uh, groups a month that they reimburse at thirty bucks a day, right? And one individual session, which is roughly thirty bucks a day, give or take. Don't quote me on that. So, to keep someone in treatment. Right for a month on methadone. If they're getting one dose and would you say three um, three groups and a a one on one, we're looking at to keep someone on methadone for a month is going to be roughly two hundred and fifty bucks for yeah. the month. Yeah, as opposed where to where like that's like a t a tenth of what dude, one day could cost upwards. I know for a fact there's there's facilities that only work without a network benefits and they bill. 
good for them. They have fantastic staff, so right. that's why it's good because yeah. they can afford it's the a different staff. Level, different type of care. Yeah, they're billing upwards of seventy five thousand dollars for thirty days. Jeez. I mean, right? So, like, if you're oh an insurance God. company, what do you want to reimburse? You don't want to reimburse seventy five thousand right. dollars. You'd much rather reimburse two hundred and fifty. Of course, of course. This is a no brainer. So. Right. That's the kind of stuff that needs to stop in addiction treatment because that's those practices, which is like the insurance company dictating what happens to people. That's the stuff that's killing us. Right. And I don't really see that changing anytime soon. So, you know, uh, I'd say the, the, the more likely scenario is probably that, you know, different types of programs like the one we have here or, you know, other programs that are out there that are similar. Uh, kind of tailoring their program based off of 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 what's what where, where the insurance money's coming yeah. from or, or how, how it is. I I just think I mean, in the grand scheme of things, uh, you know, changing the the big insurance uh, industry in the United States is it's it's an issue. Yeah. It's like and it but and it's like a massive. I mean, I've met with some people and um to try to talk about getting surfside covered and mm-hmm. and things of that nature. And they're they're pretty much like, yeah, that's never going to happen. Right. Like that's the response I get. And and when I like present them with the numbers of based on like the amount of guys that will return to residential treatment versus won't return if they have a shot, just like based on that, they're like, yeah, you could save millions of dollars, but like it's just not going to happen. Yeah, because there's just the, the, the return on, on the yeah. investment for them is probably just not there. Yeah. Well, is what it is, I so, guess. So. Um, so I think, uh, you know, coming down the pipe, uh, we have uh, we're going to cover the second step, understanding the second step. I think that's our next uh, podcast yeah, topic. Do a coming. short one on that for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, do you have anything else to add on the uh, on on the mat side? I think we covered a lot. Uh, we've been talking for almost forty, <laughs> almost thirty five minutes. Yeah, I just the last thing I would say is like, I mean, if you're a chronic relapser that's watching this and like you cannot figure it out, like give it a shot, but just know that it's not the pill itself is not going to fix the problem. Right. You it's know, like the there's got to be more. And like, if that, if that gets you sober long enough that you can start doing the work we've been talking about, like whether it's 12 step therapy, combination of the two, like that's great. But mm-hmm. you know, ultimately like the work's got to come from inside. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know that from, uh, from experience too. Yeah. So it's gotta be, it's an, it's an inside job, but whatever keeps you alive long enough, to do that is uh is important so uh make sure you check us out on our facebook page at surfside structured sober living uh on twitter is surfside ssl instagram surfside nj and our website structured sober living.com uh thanks for tuning into this episode and uh you know stay tuned for uh you know the upcoming one uh understanding the second step thanks <laughs>